It's 1859 and there was this guy named Charles Darwin. He rode on a beagle to these islands and had a little idea. Just like humans can take the variety that they saw in animals and breed horses to be faster or dogs to be more hot dog-like, given enough time, old Charlie D figured nature could do the same thing and take even the smallest, slimiest of creatures and create the biggest, most baddest of T-Rexes. Nice. But there was one doubt that he couldn't shake, a problem that threatened to undo his entire theory. Here's the story. Charles pretty well anticipated and answered most objections that were posed to his theory in The Origin of Species, but had some serious doubts about one in particular, the Cambrian fossils. Darwin expected very gradual change in animals and thus a smooth succession of fossils, but what the fossil showed was the opposite. There was a sudden appearance of wild new animals out of nowhere and they remained essentially unchanged throughout the fossil record. This is a big problem. We're missing a ton of fossils. If we can't find them, it just could prove my whole theory wrong. The fossils don't agree with you, neener, neener, neener. Harvard paleontologist Louis Agassiz and other prominent naturalists wouldn't let him forget it either. Yeah, okay, you guys are right for now, but what if the fossil record is just incomplete? Don't worry, we'll totally find those fossils later. Boom, problem solved. So tons of younger naturalists, we're talking Joseph Hooker, Thomas Huxley, Ernst Haeckel, Asa Gray, they were convinced. Old coots like Agassiz just missed the boat. See you later, suckers. These Victorian naturalists didn't yet have the data or tools to explore the question much further, so they just held out hope that the fossils would turn up eventually and focus their efforts elsewhere. But that would soon change. The year's 1909 now, and along comes Charles Doolittle Walcott. He was hanging out up in Canada, digging holes, looking at rocks, when... Dum dum dum. Uh, Chuck, I think I found something. Walcott found the motherlode, an unprecedented trove of immaculately preserved Cambrian fossils. These didn't contain the precursor forms Darwin expected either. In fact, it only made the problem bigger, suggesting an even greater suddenness than Darwin even expected. Okay, so I know this looks pretty bad, but what if, get this, there really are tons of intermediate fossils, and we'll totally find those later, say, under the sea. Fantastic idea, Chuck. I'm sure it'll just sort itself out and won't be a nagging problem for decades to come. No siree. Back to work, boys. Hey, Chuck, good news. We've invented these giant drills that can take samples from the sea floor. How about we finally find those pesky fossils we've been looking for? Awesome idea. Still nothing. Hmm, I wonder what could be the problem. Hmm. The answer wasn't under the sea either. The more they looked for the missing fossils, the more it confirmed Darwin's initial doubt. Some attempts were made to explain it, but they really fell short. Oh, oh, I know. Maybe the Precambrian animals just didn't have enough hard bits that could survive the fossilization process. Those silly, squishy Precambrian animals, you know how they're so soft and squishy. Good news, everybody. We found some fossilized jellyfish. Isn't that cool? And sponges. Wow, how lucky of us. Okay, well, what if the fossils we're looking for, maybe they're just too small for us to see. That explains why we can't find them, because they're so teensy tiny. Oh, more good news, my dudes. We found fossilized bacteria. Isn't that so, so weird? What's wrong? <laughs> hey, look at this. DNA. Pretty cool, right? Ooh, swirly. Who needs fossils anyway? Pfft, what even are they? Rocks? Big deal. DNA. This is the key to evolution. Even though Darwin's elusive pre-Cambrian fossils never turned up, the steady march of science progressed elsewhere, and it shored up the theory in the minds of its supporters. DNA in particular was giving up its secrets and provided a whole new insight into life. All the cool scientists were on board. Forget fossils, everybody knows evolution is a fact, and we all lived happily ever after. Oh no, what is this? Philadelphia, 1966. A bunch of math nerds got together and they started rocking the evolutionary boat. We're talking big wigs like MIT's Murray Eden, Harvard's Ernst Mayer, Richard, Richie Rich Lewontin, French mathematician Marcel Schutzenberger, and the one, the only, the Nobel laureate himself, Sir Peter Medawar. Okay, so you guys know this whole neo-Darwinian thing, it's not looking so hot right now. Animals need cells to function and do stuff, right? Right. And cells need little bits to do stuff, right? Yep. And those little bits need DNA to do stuff, right? Uh-huh. Well, maybe we should, I don't know, calculate the chances of that sort of thing happening. 
And they did just that. The field of computer science had come on the scene and now that DNA was better understood, scientists were eager to see how easy or difficult it would be for the Darwinian mechanism to generate the information that DNA required to create new forms of life. Fossils or not, if the numbers showed that random mutation could make the simplest bits of life, then the biologists were confident that they've got a good shot at making the more complicated things. So these nerds did what they do best. They crunched the numbers and the results were tentative, but they didn't look good for the biologists. The mutational mechanism, as presently imagined, could fall short by hundreds of orders of magnitude of producing in a mere 4 billion years even a single required gene. They couldn't get the numbers to work for even the simplest building blocks of life, much less the whole animals that appeared in the Cambrian. While most scientists were still happy to accept Darwin's mechanism, skepticism was growing. After Wistar in the 1970s, young biologists could no longer ignore the geological record's lack of the expected pre-Cambrian fossils. In time, the science developed to more accurately measure the likelihood of whether or not the Neo-Darwinian mechanism could account for the Cambrian explosion. These experiments demonstrated that even on evolutionary deep time, the odds of random mutation and natural selection acting on DNA to make the animals in the Cambrian explosion were slim, to say the least. Early estimates pinned the odds at around 10 to the 90th to 10 to the 63rd. More precise, recent experimental results pinned the number at 10 to the 77th. That is one chance in 100,000 trillion. Trillion, trillion. Trillion, trillion. Trillion. For random mutation in natural selection to generate just one single protein, much less than millions in a typical cell. Even evolutionary deep time is far insufficient. The simplest self-reproducing organism is so insanely complex that the amount of time needed for Neo-Darwinianism to have a fighting chance vastly exceeds the most generous age of the entire universe. We're not talking rocky odds or mighty ducks odds. We're talking an elderly one-legged turtle in the Kentucky Derby kind of odds. So evolutionary scientists today are more and more acknowledging that the Neo-Darwinian model has proven simply inadequate in providing an answer to the question of life. The popular public-facing side of science does like to present a united front that all is well, but seeing so many problems mount and answers lacking, the Darwinian landscape has been broken up into a number of competing factions. And that brings us to today. These are all hotly debated and they do shore up some of the weaknesses of the standard model but they all struggled to be viable for unique reasons of their own. Darwin's biggest problem about his theory over 150 years ago hasn't been allayed by recent science, it's only been amplified. If it's so difficult to prove what these scientists want to believe, why do so many cling to their presuppositions? That's a great question for another video.